I've long avoided giving a discussion on a subject that I believe is so prevalent in mysticism and occultism, particularly that of the Western tradition, that I almost feel it is disingenuous to never speak on it, or at least to wait this long. Therefore today, I'm going to be giving a brief talk. It will not be animated in the way that some of you are used to, as some of these past podcast style videos have been, uh, and that is because I do not generally have photography to actually display these things. They will be described in semi-detail, verbally, and I believe that through verbal expansion we will be able to get an idea of what's going on here. Before we speak on the ideas of Isis, we need at least a superficial overview of who she is and what she represents. Many people will readily know, especially if you're watching this video, that Isis is the wife to Osiris. However, you may not know that the Egyptian mysteries were separated into two major categories, and I know this only to the extent that they were documented by Herodotus, the ancient Greek historian. Now, that is the best account that we have of these particular traditions, and fortunately he did document the lesser mystery, so to say, or the ritual initiation of the lesser mystery. I will be pulling this directly from the Dictionary of Freemasonry, and that is at my own convenience, so I do not have to scour the works of Herodotus seeking it. So, Isis we might note, is the chief divinity in the sense of the divine feminine in the Egyptian pantheon. Being the wife to Osiris, this puts her very high on the tier, but she's also representative of nature. We note in the Kabbalah, Elohim itself is also referential to the aspect and forces of nature, with a little bit more complexity than I can provide through the Egyptian style, but that is the case. Now, it will be known that historically speaking, the Osirian mysteries, while being the greater mysteries, we do not see the myth of Osiris being chopped into pieces and then recollected by Isis to be assembled, so to say, uh, until later, historically. So this particular work that is documented is going to be pre the usage of that mystery, at least in the lesser sense. It might have existed in the greater, but I do not know. So we will not address the rites of Isis or what I should say is this lesser Egyptian rite and ritual, through the scope of detailing every little thing that's going on, what is worn, the garb, and things of that nature. Instead, we will generalize the experience, and we will go over some of the more interesting tidbits. I would like to add that the most interesting part of this practice is actually the trial of elements. We see in a variety of initiatic bodies a trial of elements. It is something that has persisted for such a long time, and considering the nature of Isis as a representative for nature, but also as an entity that might represent the physical manifestation of creation, we see this as the procession of the human life, which is a very interesting allegory. Also, the illumination that occurs through the symbols of the elements, something that I believe is very, very prevalent in almost all occult and esoteric bodies. In short, we can note that this initiatory individual, or this to-be-initiated individual, is taken away. He is fasting. He is going through the motions, so to say, the preparatory cause, or preparatory course, which we will find in a variety of spaces. This is going to be eating lightly, being very chaste, so to say. But he's also already been tried, and what I mean by tried is that he has been tested, that he is living a moral and at least a priestly proper life before being initiated. Which brings us to the actual initiation. It's a very interesting matter that after he has gone through this purification, so to say, he is shuffled into the pyramids, and the pyramid itself contains all of the necessary, we might say, compartments and contraptions and spaces to go through the ritual. Now, it begins with the descent into a small cave and by small cave, I should say a channel into a cave. The movement through the channel is much like saying the veil. It is like saying a distinct removal from what is normal and stepping into a new place. You might note this as something akin to the hero's journey as a fantastic literary device, but there is always a transitionary period. And this crawling, so to say, which is what they would do, they would crawl through this small space, is the representation of that transition. Then they come out into chambers, the first chamber being a cave. Many people do not look at the mysteries of the cave, or I should just say the symbolism of the cave is a very large deal, when in fact it is one of the greatest deals. 
cave rites, cave rituals of all sorts throughout human history have always represented the entirety of the universe. Many people might even think of Plato's allegory of the cave as a representation of human experience, as the limitation of reality as far as those people know it. And now they are stepping into a new place, a strange place that is eye-opening. It is, in a sense, it is the representation of revelation, of awe-striking, awe-inspiring experiences and information. Now, as he makes his way through the cave, various individuals who are partaking in the ritual, not as initiates, but as, we might say, thespians, are out and about wearing the masks of jackals armed with weaponry, and they seek to alarm the individual in the Stark Cave with their terrifying noises, their upsetting and strange demeanors, their, well, first of all, danger to the individual by having these weapons. They are not there to actually injure this person. But the concept of fear is a phenomenal representation of the human experience. It is the darkness of the cave. It is the trial of Earth. It is the unknown and the willingness to step into the unknown before the challenge ever even really occurs. It is like saying you must be willing to face the fear. Or I believe that the famous quote goes, the treasure which you seek or the rewards which you seek lie in the cave of which you fear to enter. But then, the initiate makes their way into the Halls of Fire. And this Hall of Fire, being the next element, is phenomenally represented because the space itself is <laughs> burning. <laughs> it is a, the perfect representation of fire. And fire in itself is such an amazing spiritual symbol that is really not described in any sort of esoteric manner in this sense or at least not in this text, but we are very comfortable with the ideas of fire as a spiritual symbol, or at least a metaphysical one. But we understand that there is a challenge to be held, or a challenge to be had, that is presenting itself to the individual. It is another layer of fear, but it is also a destructive force. In fact, everything that he will experience in this way is represented as a destructive force, which he must overcome. Because he then makes his way to a water channel, and the water channel is fed by the Nile River. It is rushing and he must take a small lit lamp across the river or to cross the river and make his way to the other side which he is then met into a new chamber so as you can see we've gone through a trial of earth fire and water and then as he makes his way into this new chamber this strange hallway there will be a circumstance in which the floor falls out beneath him and he must suspend himself to the best of his ability within this small hallway to not fall now apparently as the story goes, the fall is not lethal by any means, but it is made to look so. And over time, the contraption will then bring itself back up, and the gate which he has sought to enter, a beautiful ivory door, will then open, whereby he will be met with the priestesses of the Icinian order to formally begin a sense of education, take obligations, and be met with his new charges and his regalia, etc., etc. You understand the point. This kind of begs the question... What is the point of all these things? Why would something like this be so prevalent within so many initiatic societies throughout human history? It is because initiation as a whole is always a representation for the experience of life. It cannot go beyond that. It cannot be outside of the spheres of what we deal with. And its main theme tends to be, well, struggle and strife. Concern with worldly affairs, concern with worldly matters, and of course, fear of death. These matters are, while so obvious and clear to many of us, when directly experienced and put as a, we might say, stepping stone into an actual educational space or point to be educated, specifically in a metaphysical, mystical, or spiritual tradition, send a message. And that message is that what you are seeking and where you are going and what is important to you is no longer going to do with the material world. And this is the basis why it is the lesser mystery or the Icinian mystery is because you are now stepping out of normalcy, out of the material, and into a space which is going to be differentiated and very special. We see this in architecture. We see this in people's actions. We see this in our common psychology. Spaces that are special hold a certain level of honor. They hold a certain level of completeness. They hold a certain level of irreplaceability. 
because they represent something that is beyond the normal. They are, in a human sense, sacred. And they are not made sacred necessarily by regalia or by decor or decoration. They are made sacred by what they represent, their symbolic existence based on the initiation or based on what went on or what they deal with in terms of your spiritual alignments. And this is why we find in so many modern practices, people have altars, sacred spaces, things of that nature. Because these are not new ideas. If someone tells you that an altar is a new idea or they tell you to design one in such and such a way, in a sense, it's almost as if we're wasting our time because it completely disregards what was valuable about the experience to begin with. Now, I know that was a lot and that was very quick, but I wanted to share the writings of Herodotus so we might have some idea of the lesser mystery of Isis from Egypt. Thank you, and I'll see you next time.